Welcome to Calvary Chapel Somerville. Happy Sunday. It is a good day to praise the Lord, and that's what we're going to do here in this place. This is the day that you have made. Whatever comes, I won't complain. For all my hope is in your name. And now your joy awaits my praise. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing. Lord, I brought me out. You set my feet on higher ground. So here I stand. You are my God. Your faithfulness, my solid rock. I give thanks. I give thanks for all you have done. And I will sing of your mercy and your love. Your love is unfailing but I am grateful I give thanks for all you have done I won't forget all the battles you have won your love is unfailing but I am grateful For all you have done And I will see of your mercy and your love Your love is unfailing Lord, I am grateful I give thanks for all you have done I won't forget all the battles you have won Your love is unfailing Lord, I I will see 
of the goodness of God. I love your voice. You have led me through the fire in darkest night like no other. known you as a friend and I have lived in the goodness of God and all my life you have been faithful and all my life you have been so of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running out, it's running after me. Your goodness is running out, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give. worthy of all of our praise this morning. Father, you and you alone are faithful. You are good. And God, we declare that this morning. Lord, we thank you for your goodness that you've shown towards us, God, and that you sent your son, Lord, to die for our sins, that we might be raised in life. God, that is good. You are good. So this morning, God, help us to turn our our eyes and our minds towards you. Lord, that we might stand on you and your promises, trusting you 
to be all that you say you are. God, we love you and we praise you this morning in this place. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you, we live for you. Holy, there is no one like you, there is none beside you, open up my eyes in wonder and show heart and lead me in your love to those around me. It's worthy of every song. Worthy of every song we could ever Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Jesus, the name above. Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say, worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy. Holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those
Jesus. Father, I thank you, Lord, for all that you've done. Lord, I ask God this morning that you would continue, Lord, to just draw us in closer to you, that we might see your heart, your love, and your grace, and your mercy, that we would be stirred, God, to respond. Lord, knowing that your mercy was greater than our sin and those mercies are new every morning thank you father in you we have hope father thank you that you pursue us god your goodness chases after us how can you be anything other than good even in the midst of things that are not so good. Help us to remember you are good and you are love. You are the one who forgives us and frees us and restores us and redeems us. And God, we thank you that you have secured a place for your children to be with you for all eternity. So God, open our hearts this morning, please, Father, that we might be broken of anything that is us that we might allow you to just conform us into your image Lord that you would have your way in us we thank you for your word and we thank you for your presence we love you and we honor you this morning in Jesus name we pray amen amen thank you for listening to change the world with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville it is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ now, with today's message, here's Pastor Vic. Let's pray. Father, that is our prayer this morning, that you would teach us your statutes. That you would teach us to keep your precepts, that you would help us, Lord, not to forget your law and your word. And as we open your word today, God, just pray for a mighty anointing upon this service. We thank you for the ability to be able to know you, to be able to have greater intimacy through your word. And so, God, would you do that this morning? Would you meet us here? Would you just have your majesty fill this place, fill our hearts with your love and your mercy, fill our hearts with your grace, fill our hearts with your word? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you would, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6. As we continue our journey through God's Word, we're, we're in the middle of the second letter that Paul wrote 
to the church in Corinth. And last week, you'll remember how Paul encouraged us as Christians. He, he communicated how important it is that we keep suffering and, and even death. We need to keep it in its proper perspective. And he likened our earthly bodies to a tent. And he said, even if our tent, even if this body is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. So who cares about a dumb old tent when you've got a, a priceless magnificent mansion in paradise and then Paul talked about the fact that when we breathe our last talked about how immediately we are ushered into the very presence of the Lord to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord and so whatever suffering we might endure this this side of heaven and there will be suffering but whatever we endure this side of heaven Paul wants us to know that it's all going to be worth it for the Christian this all ends up with you in paradise, engulfed forever and ever in the majesty of the God of the universe. That's, that's the promise. And Paul communicated how God has given us a guarantee of this promise in that he has given us the Holy Spirit. He's given us a small sample of, of his presence on this side of heaven. And then Paul challenged each of us that because of this promise, and because of this blessed assurance of heaven, it should compel all of us to live our lives in such a way that we bring pleasure to God. The sole purpose of my life should be that I love God so much, I want every aspect of my life to bring a smile to His face. My goal in all that I say and do is to make my Father proud of me. And Paul closed out the chapter by reminding us that anyone who is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What does that mean? Well, for the believer, it's good news. It means that my sin, my past, it's all been wiped clean. It's all been washed away. But for the unbeliever, for the person who has never been born again, what this communicates is despite how good a person someone might think they are, no one is getting into heaven with the stain of sin still upon them. No one's getting into heaven without what is required of heaven, and that's righteousness. No one's getting into heaven without this new beginning or being born again. And it's Jesus and only Jesus who qualifies men and women. Religion is all about going around trying to qualify yourself for heaven. You can't do it. Jesus is the only one who qualifies men and women for heaven. And, and, and how does he do it? He, he does it, as we talked about last week, by the one thing that you could never get rid of on your own is the stain of your sin. What does Jesus do? He takes it. And then the one thing you could never attain on your own, which is righteousness, he gives it. And thus, last, the last verse of, of, of chapter 5, look at it, look at it with me. It says, for he, God the Father, made him Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. He took our sin, why? That we might become the righteousness of God in him. And so Paul continues with that in verse 6, I'm sorry, verse 1 of chapter 6. We then, as workers together with him, with God. Remember, Paul talked about the fact that since we've been saved, since we've been given, um, we've been reconciled unto God, God has given us what Paul called the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, since you've been saved, since you've become a partaker of the gospel, it's your responsibility to then go and to share the good news of the gospel with others. Salvation doesn't end with you. You, you don't get saved and then bury that somewhere deep within you you know, only to be thought of, you know, at the rapture or, or, or um, you know, at the, at the time of your death. Salvation doesn't end with you. You, you. you are to go and to share it with others. You are partakers. You are your co-workers with Christ in, in that regard, Paul says. And Paul last week, he, he used the word ambassador. An ambassador is one who is sent to a foreign land as a representative of, of the king. He, he or she doesn't have their own agenda. 
They don't have their own voice. They are a voice. They, they, they convey the heart of the king. So we are ambassadors. We are co-workers with God in this building of God's kingdom. So God has a business in this world. He's a business owner. And as a child of God, as a son or a daughter, you are now partakers in that business. You're, you're workers in that business, as, as Paul says. Now, it's God's business. It's his, it's his work. He's the worker. We're just the co-workers. We're the, the helpers. It's not that he needs our help. Certainly, he does not. But for whatever reason, he finds pleasure. He finds pleasure in allowing us to help him in, in, his, in his business. It's like, uh, you know, your three-year-old daughter, your, your three-year-old daughter wanting to help you bake cookies or whatever. Do you really need her help? But you'll find pleasure in that she wants to help mommy or, or, or whatever. I remember when my kids, like seeing Cameron when they were little, one time <clears throat> I was mowing the yard. I was out back mowing, and then they both came out and asked, you know, hey, Daddy, can we help you? Can we help? And, and, you know, truthfully, what could they do other than probably get in the way more than anything? But it blessed me that they wanted to help. They wanted to partake in my work and they wanted to be uh, useful, you know, to me. So, you know, I told them, I said, all right, I'll come up with something for you to do, something that would be very helpful to me. I said, you can just go along the fence here and just pull up all the weeds along the fence as you go. Now, I could have taken a weed eater and done in five seconds what it would take them 20 minutes to do, but it brought me pleasure, the fact that that my kids wanted to co-labor with me. So I I left them there pulling weeds. And I walked back to the mower. I got a smile on my face. You know, it's just, it brings me joy that my kids want to help. And I kid you not, five minutes later, I look up to the fence, to the area where I left them, and they were gone. <laughs> I'm like, what in the world? And I look to the other side of the yard, and there, there's both of them chasing after a frog. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know what? The Lord spoke to me. That's you. <laughs> Often. The Lord calls me to a legitimate work. And He calls me to, you know, He gives me this, this awesome calling. He doesn't need my help, but He allows me. He gives me this awesome calling. And, and then I get off track because I either get bored, I get distracted by even, you know, the most mundane things in life. And, and God looks at me and, you know, from His perspective, there I am chasing after frogs. But I, I want you to notice here in verse 1, subtle, but I think it's important. It, but here in verse 1, what God has called us to in regards to this ministry of reconciliation, it's important to note that Paul calls us workers. It's work. Meaning the fact that you've been entrusted with the ministry of reconciliation this is not, you know, I'm the son or daughter of, of the one who owns the cattle of a thousand hills, so now I get to, you know, kick back my feet in a recliner or become a couch potato or whatever. No, I'm in the family business. It's, it's work. God calls me to work. God's not going to call us to a place of ease and comfort as long as there's work to do. In his kingdom. And, and work takes what? It takes commitment. It takes dedication. It takes sacrifice. A good worker goes beyond what he feels like doing. Can you imagine your employee? I mean, your, your employer telling you, hey, I need you to go unload that truck. Eh, I'm not really feeling that today. I think I'm just going to kick back in the break room. God doesn't call us to that kind of life. He calls us to work. He calls us to do things that we don't necessarily feel like doing. A good worker, a co-laborer with God doesn't get distracted by the things of the world. Paul goes on, we then as co-workers together with him also plead with you not to receive the grace of God in vain. What does he mean? How, how can you receive the grace of God in vain? Well, there's, there's several ways, not the least of which becoming a born-again believer, but continuing to live a life that's contrary to the Word of God. 
a Christian continuing to follow after the lusts of the flesh, uh, you know, that's, that's a Christian receiving the grace of God in vain or a person. But that's not the context here. The context here is, is all about serving. It's all about working in this, this uh, family business. And, and it's about the motivation behind why we serve and why we work in, in God's kingdom and why we serve God's people. And you know, grace and works are, are very difficult things to reconcile in our finite minds because, you know, everything that, that we are, you know, that we learn from this high, you've got to earn it. You've got to work for everything that you get. And, but, but grace doesn't have anything to do with works. So it's easy to get off track and get a wrong mindset of grace if we're not careful because we need to understand that God's grace is independent of works. God doesn't extend his grace to anyone because of their works, past, present, or future. But even though grace is independent of works, Make no mistake about it. This in no way communicates that works are unnecessary. Works are very necessary. In fact, uh, God's grace, though it's independent of works, understanding the scope of God's grace is what should inspire us and motivate us to good works. God's grace should motivate us to godly living and, and striving for holiness. And so, Works is independent of grace, but works is a byproduct of grace. So the point is that when God extends his grace to a human being, the point is is that grace is not to become buried or it's not to become passive in your life. It's to be worked out. Now, we make the problem or we make the mistake of uh, as as selfish people that we can be you know we're just all about god give me your grace and we sing about grace and we we receive god's grace uh but that's where it ends when it when it when he calls on us to extend grace to others well wait a minute it's a different story there but god's grace god's favor you know none of that ends with you and so for you to receive god's favor or god's grace and then in turn hinder it or obstruct it, or deny it, then then you're receiving the grace of God in vain. So God extends His grace. We allow that grace to work in us and through us, and and that's how the work of God gets done. Verse 2, for He, God, says, and, and Paul's bringing into application God's word now, so he's like, don't just take my word for it. God says, Quoting Isaiah 49, 8, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation I have helped you, because now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So now that Paul has communicated the work of God, he's described and he's, he's explained this business of God, and he has communicated to you and I how we are co-laborers, we are, we are workers in our Father's uh, business, what verse 2 lets us know uh, very simply is that, is that today is a work day. You're not off today. The, this job, this family business is, is not going to last forever. And, and man, that, this was written 2,000 years ago. We can, look at, <laughs> we can look at God's business today in our time, just the signs of the times, and we can recognize This family business isn't going to last much longer at all. It's all going to come to an end very, very soon. And so the point is, is let's get busy. I mean, let's stop getting distracted by the things of the world. Yeah, there's trials. Yeah, there's persecutions. Yeah, there's pain. Yeah, there's all these things. But Jesus, like, I told you about all those things. But don't lose hope. Don't lose track. Don't become a bad employee in your father's business because of these things he's already warned you about in advance. Get busy. Jesus is like, I, I must be about my father's business. Like when, remember when they came when he was 12 years old, he's in the temple, like I couldn't find him. Like where'd you think I'd be? I'm about my father's business. And that's the way we should see it. That's the way we should look at it. Every day of our lives, what are you doing? I'm about my father's business. What'd you think? 
Of course that's what I'm doing. Co-labors. Just as the word has prompted us. That's, that's Paul's exhortation. Verse 3 he says, We give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed. Paul, Paul went above and beyond the call of duty in that regard. And he's talking about the apostles, but you know this applies to all of us. He was willing to forego and sacrifice almost anything in his life for the sake of the ministry, making sure that no one could find offense in, in his ministry. Remember 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul said, listen, as a minister of the gospel, I deserve to get paid just like you guys do. I deserve to have all of my uh, needs met. I deserve to be clothed and, and fed. But then Paul told us he was willing to forego even the necessities of life, if, it, if, if that's what it took. So, so some of these corrupt Corinthians wouldn't be able to say, well, this Paul guy, he's only in it for the money. He's like, keep your money. Paul was willing to let others be more prominent. Now think about it. Here's, here's a guy that wrote half the New Testament. Man, was he used mightily by God. Did he put himself on a pedestal? No. He was willing to let others be more prominent. Than, than himself. He was willing to work harder than anyone else, as he, as he told us in earlier chapters. He was willing to endure more hardships, all for the sake of, of making sure that he doesn't offend anyone, that he doesn't come, become a stumbling block to the message of the gospel. Now, as you know, and as we've seen in our study, regardless of how hard he tried to not offend people, people still were offended by Paul. And, and people did speak ill of him and his ministry. He, he constantly was being falsely accused and blamed. And if you're a Christian, uh, if you're someone who takes a stand for truth, there are always going to be people who oppose you to the point of attacking you, to the point of questioning your integrity as they did with Paul, as they did with Jesus. And truly, you know, you might say, well, how do I battle that kind of thing? There's only one way to battle that sort of thing. And, and, and that is to continue walking in uprightness. Understanding that there's coming a day, very, very soon, there's coming a day when, when all that is right and all that is true will be the only things left standing on this earth. There, there, there's an old saying, if, if, if you take care of your character, God will take care of your reputation. So you control what you can control. That's what Paul is saying. I, I, I've, got a, uh, I've got a calling on my life and I, I will do anything in my power to not bring a hindrance to that calling. In other words, the, the message that I teach and the way that I live, those, those are not two separate things. For the Christian, our walk and our talk, those two things have to match. There, there are to be no inconsistencies. Because when there are, a lot of times, it's the ministry and, and it's the, the gospel that is shamed in the world. Because the world's just looking at you and waiting on you, you know, you profess Christianity, the world is waiting on you to mess up and to make a mistake. Not because they just, you know, want to get at you. They want to get at Jesus. They want to get at the truth. They want to get at the message of the gospel. And so you mess up and all of a sudden, ha ha, see? Who, who, who's your Jesus? Where's his power? Where's, where, where's your gospel now? Now, we're not perfect, Sometimes our, our actions aren't going to line up with the Word of God. But the important thing is, is that we are continually growing and maturing. It's this process of sanctification, becoming, you know, a little more Christ-like every day. I mean, I, you, you look at it like this. I understand that, you know, this is the way I live and this is the way that the Bible instructs me to live. This is the way I live, and this is a life that is totally and completely uh, pleasing to God. I recognize that there's a gap there, right? But every day of my life, what I want is I want that gap to become narrower and narrower. I want that gap to be closing. God forbid, not staying the same place or even, or even widening. 
Every day, the gap between uh, who I am and who God wants me to be is getting closer and closer together. So we give no offense in anything that our ministry may not be blamed, but in all things we commend ourselves as ministers of God. And as I said, Paul endured many things for the sake of his ministry, and, and now he's going to list some of those things that are required, things that are required of, of an effective minister. And in this context here, we're all in ministry. We're all ministers. Don't think that this just applies to me. All Christians are ministers of, of, of God. As Paul said, we've all been entrusted with this ministry of reconciliation. And the first attribute that Paul lays out is in much patience. And this word patience... In the original language is hupomoni, which is better translated endurance. Because in, in the English language, the, the word patience has sort of a passive undertone. And, and that's not what Paul's communicating at all. Hupomoni, it, it means that as ministers of God, we continue with a steadfast endurance. Not turning to the left or to the right, not being swayed. Uh, or, or weighed down by the attacks of the enemy, not being distracted by the things of the world, not chasing after frogs. And he, and he says here, continuing in verse 4, he, he, he tells us here what, what, it, what it is that you know, he needed to endure. We commend ourselves in what? In tribulations, which describes, it's a word that doesn't just talk about pressure, but it's talking about a a literal crushing pressure. This is the kind of thing that I need to endure as a minister of, of, of uh, reconciliation in needs. Sometimes not knowing how my needs are going to get uh, met, where my n- next meal is going to come from even, Paul says. In distresses, which this word speaks of being in a confined place, where, you, where you're in a confined place and literally it feels like just the walls are closing in on you distresses in stripes Paul knew exactly what it was like to be beaten on a regular basis in imprisonments he was in and out of jail constantly being thrown into prison because of his faithfulness unto the Lord in tumults a lot of places where <laughs> where Paul would share the gospel most places if, if not all it would produce these riots you know me today but, uh, the most I ever face is like a, an angry email or something but you can imagine if, you, if you're the, the Apostle Paul, everywhere you go, he speaks truth. And, and what, what comes of that is, is, is this, these angry mobs that want to tear him limb from limb. So in tumults, in labors, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, I labored more abundantly than they all. In sleeplessness, in fastings, and the, the word for fastings here is not the same word used for a spiritual fasting, But Paul here is referring to times in his ministry where there was literally no food. So, he says, I go without sleep. I go without food and nourishment for your sakes and for the sake of uh, the, the, the gospel. Now, here's the great thing about God, serving the Lord. Remember, Paul is writing to people who were accusing him of of being in ministry for the money. They're accusing him of being this power-hungry guy. But as he's laying out all that he has to endure in order to fulfill the calling that God has placed on his life, no one can look at Paul and, and Paul's ministry and come to the conclusion that him being an apostle and him being a pillar of the early church, no one can say that this has led in, in any way to some you know, cushy, comfortable, lucrative, easy life for him. Just the opposite. And so, here's his point. Listen, who signs up for going without sleep? Who signs up for going without food? Who signs up for tribulations and beatings and imprisonments? Who who signs up for all that, that Paul endured unless Paul had his priorities and his perspectives in order and he knew that it was all, you know, for a monumentally greater eternal purpose? I was talking to, uh, having a conversation um, many years back with a, a, a co-worker, atheist. 
co-worker. And we would have these philosophical conversations. He was a pretty intelligent guy. At least he thought he was. But, you know, he would, he would voice these things very articulately. And I, I just remember one day he said with a very proud and a, and, and a very confident sort of voice, he said, you know, the, the disciples, they made up the story of Jesus' resurrection just so it would, you know, further their agenda. And we were in company of several people, and I said, oh, really? I said, was it their agenda to leave their families to be constantly beaten to within an inch of their lives? Was it their agenda to be mocked, ridiculed, and hated so much that they all, with the exception of one, uh, became martyrs? Was it their agenda to be abused, tormented, and tortured for something that, according to you, they knew to be a lie? Because that's the only way your theory holds any weight. And so here is Paul living out the words of Jesus, where Jesus said, in this life you will have tribulation. Understand that, that salvation, going to heaven is free. But to live for Jesus in this world, it comes with a tremendous price. Because since the devil couldn't destroy Jesus, the next best thing is to destroy the ones or seek to destroy the ones who follow him. Now he knows his outcome. He knows ultimately where he's going to end up. And so all he can do, the best that he can muster up is to take as many of God's creation with him as he possibly can. But what you need to understand, you know, though he's going to attack you from every front, and though the world is going to come at you, this whole study of, of, of 2 Corinthians, what we need to understand and what Paul understood is that any price that you pay in this world for the sake of following after Jesus, any price that we pay comes with an infinitely greater reward. And, and not just in heaven, even, even in this world, the, the, the tribulations, even what the devil uses in his attempts to destroy you, God's going to take those things and He's going to turn them into uh, using them for your good. Using them to uh, raise you up into spiritual maturity to close that gap between who you are and, and who He wants you to be. He's going to use those things to reveal Himself to you more and more. And, and I mean, as God's creation, shouldn't that be our ultimate goal in life is just I want to know more about God. I want to have greater intimacy with him. I want, I, I want to have everything that he has promised his creation. I want to have the fullness of all of his blessings. So after laying out all of the things that Paul has to suffer for Christ's sake, now he's going to list the fruit of it all. He's going to list some things that says, yeah, there's suffering, but out of it comes what? Verse 6, by purity. Enduring through trials produces holy living, if you let it. It's what helps me along in my pursuit of godliness. By knowledge, through trials, I, I become more aware of who God is. I become more aware of His grace and His mercy in my life, His love for me. I become more knowledgeable of how to minister to others. Think about it. I can tell you right now, I can certainly appreciate and I can have much more compassion for whatever it is that you're walking through if I have walked through it myself at one point in time. So what do these trials do? They give me the opportunity to go and to minister to others who might be experiencing some of the same kind of things that I've uh, experienced before. By long-suffering, by kindness, I learn to be more patient and compassionate with people. By the Holy Spirit, without which, by the way, none of these things would be manifested in our lives. By sincere love. And why does he just not, why did he just, just say by love? He puts sincere love because he wants you to know he's not talking about a hypocritical love. What has been produced in Paul's life through trials is a love. How do you, how do you know it's sincere love? Well, you know it's sincere if you have a love for your enemies. You have a love for people who oppose you. You have a love for people uh, 
even for those who are out to destroy you and out to destroy your ministry. So Paul says it's a a sincere love. Verse 7, by the word of truth, how the Bible becomes my standard by which all things are measured. I don't think you've ever, ever searched for truth any more than when you're in the midst of a fiery trial. Even I don't care if you're an atheist. You're like, oh, what's going on? Why is this happening? How can I get out of this? What can I learn from it? Or, or, or whatever. And ultimately, if you'll open up your mind and you'll open up your heart, what's going to happen is that trial is going to lead you to having the Bible become your ultimate source of truth because truthfully, it's the only thing that brings peace. It's the only thing that makes it all make sense. Understand? By the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. In other words, righteous living in spite of the trial. What Paul's talking about here is is it's your shield. So you're in the midst of this trial. And, and now people are watching you. And, and what is it that's going to facilitate or it's going to protect you on all fronts against false allegations? Now, that doesn't mean there won't be false allegations, but what's going to protect you from them it, 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 and what's going to protect you from um, you know, attacks on your character and integrity is for you to continue walking in righteousness. For you to continue walking in in uprightness. And now Paul's going to conclude this thought by comparing what the world thinks of him to what God thinks of him. And this is important. Because we both got, I mean, we've all got both of those things speaking into our ears at, at, at various times. So, what the world thinks versus what God thinks. Verse 8, by honor and dishonor. By evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as chastened and yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing and yet possessing all things. And so the world speaks of Paul as it speaks of all Christians speaks of us with dishonor, evil report, lies about us, deceiving. The world sees us, as it says here, as unknown. Who are you? Sees us as dying, chastened, sorrowful. Oh, those poor pitiful Christians, you know. Remember the Billy Joel song, I'd rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. Only the good die young. That's the way the world sees it. Oh, those, look at those poor, pathetic little Christians. Sorrowful, poor, having nothing. But then God describes Paul and all Christians this way. With honor, good report, true, well known, and not just well known in the world, well known by the God of the universe as we talked about last week. Behold, we live, not killed, always rejoicing, making many rich, possessing all things. Quite a contrast. And you know what? Each of us, you get to decide this morning which description is true of you. You don't get to decide which description is true. You get to decide which description you believe. Now, according to the things which are seen, according to our sight, it appears that the world's description of us is true, doesn't it? And it's only according to the things that are not seen, according to faith in God's description. Only then it's understood to be true when it's received by faith. I believe it. And the just shall live by what? So whose opinion is more valuable to you? Which opinion is more trustworthy? Which opinion is more tried and true and dependable? The world's opinion of you, Christian, or God's? 
And in verse 11, O Corinthians, we have spoken openly to you. We have spoken the truth with love. Our heart is wide open. You are not restricted by us, but you are restricted by your own affections. In other words, if there is a lack of love in this relationship, now Paul's talking about himself, the apostles, and the relationship that's been formed with this Corinthian church. And he's saying, if, if there is a lack of love in this relationship between you and us, it's not because we have withheld love, it's because you have. Now, these particular Christians, the reason they were cold in regards to their love for Paul and their love for the other apostles and their love for truth, frankly, the reason they were cold is because they had had their hearts stolen by false teachers. They'd, they'd had their hearts stolen by the lies of the enemy. They were believing what the enemy was saying to them and rejecting and discarding what God was saying. They have compromised truth. They've, and thus they've compromised their hearts. They've compromised the very definition of love. Now you might think you love somebody and you might think you're in this relationship whatever it is spousal friendship business whatever it is you're in a relationship based on love but if you're in a relationship based on love that love can come with no conditions love is a choice love is an act of obedience love doesn't come with conditions remember 1 Corinthians chapter 13 so if you say you love someone, but then they don't meet up to some, cert, some sort of standard that you have placed on their love, then ex- that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. The reason that there's no love in this relationship is not because they haven't loved you, it's because you haven't loved them unconditionally. In verse 13, now in return for the same, the same love and affection I have for you, I speak as to, to children, very, very immature but I speak that you also be open. So Paul's trying to mend this relationship between him and the Corinthian church. But in order for the relationship to be mended, the Corinthians are going to have to have their hearts turned back to the truth and have their hearts turned away from anything that is keeping them from the truth and turning their hearts away from anything that has compromised their lives. So Paul exhorts them, verse 14, do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. And and, and this idea goes all the way back to the law, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verses 9 and 10. You shall not sow your vineyard with different kinds of seed, lest the yield of the seed which you have sown and the fruit of your vineyard be defiled. You shall not plow with an ox and a donkey together. Can you imagine? Now, if you put two oxen together, they'll work in harmony with one another. You yoke two two donkeys together, the same. But can you imagine yoking a donkey with an ox? You're not going to get a whole lot of work done. That's for sure. Because they're constantly going to be pulling against each other and and trying to go in, in opposite directions. Now, if you've been a Christian for very long, you've heard of this concept and you've heard of this idea of, of you know, the, the danger of being unequally yoked. Um, you know, and, and, and mostly it's presented in the context of, of marriage. And truly, uh, a believer marrying an unbeliever, at, at best you're setting yourself up for a life where, where there's going to be a constant struggle and a constant pulling in opposite directions, like yoking a, a, a donkey and an ox together. Clark, in his commentary, says, A Christian cannot pray, lead me not into temptation, as they are plunging into it of their own accord. So, certainly, it is biblically wrong, and it's a bad decision for a believer to marry a, a non-believer. But what Paul is referring to here goes much deeper than that, and it's, and it's all encompassing. It's not just talking about marriage. He's talking, he's warning uh, against any sort of relations, whether it be friendships or, or business acquaintances, any relationship that would help influence the way we act, the way we think, and the way we believe in, in any environment where we might be influenced according to the world standards 
and, and be led away from the, the, the biblical standard of truth. Now, Paul's not suggesting that, that as Christians, you know, we cannot or must not associate with unbelievers. Obviously, we have to be in the world to, to shine the light of Jesus in the world. The Bible doesn't instruct us that after we're saved, okay, here's your, here's your ticket. You're now assigned to, you know, this deserted island that's been, you know, designated for, for Christians. Um, we, we have to be in the world. But the idea and what Paul is getting at here is, is that we cannot be of the world. For instance, a boat, it, it, it has to be in the water in order to accomplish what it was built to do. And, and, and the boat, you know, being in the water is not the problem. It's a big problem when water gets in the boat. And the same thing, it wasn't a problem that the Corinthians were in the world. The problem was is that the world was in them. They were compromising. They were being conformed to the world. They were conforming to worldly thinking and thus worldly behavior. When, you, when you're of the world and you, and you are participating in, in you know, all of these worldly things, you, you can profess Christianity all you want to, um, but you're acting like an unbeliever. You're behaving like non-believers act. You might come to church and you might sing the songs to Christ and sing the songs about forgiveness and grace and salvation and, and God is good, yes and amen, and raise your hands. But if you're of the world, you'll think like the world and you'll act like the world. And here Paul says, for what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? And what communion has light with darkness? Now just, you just look at nature alone. This is about to blow your mind what I'm getting ready to tell you right here. But did you know that it is impossible for light and dark to occupy the same space at the same time? Isn't that crazy? I'm being facetious. That's pretty funny. But <clears throat> I figured you already knew that. But anyway, it's, it's very, very true. So, the point is, how can righteousness and lawlessness occupy the same body? And the answer is they can't. Verse 15, what accord has Christ with Belial or, or Satan? And the answer is none. But the point is, that's exactly what you're doing when you seek to have lawlessness fellowship with righteousness in your life. When you seek to have darkness and light residing in the same place. It just can't happen. You're pledging allegiance to both Christ and Satan when the truth is those two cannot reside in the same place and won't. Or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? The mistake that many Christians make, as I said before, is to think that they can be in the presence of all these ungodly things and be in the presence of, of uh, in these you know, ungodly atmospheres and ungodly people, and then to think that those, those things aren't going to influence who they become or the way they think. And then the, we see that the Bible over and over strongly warns us against that kind of company. In fact, the Bible says, do not be deceived. I mean, you are fooling yourself. You know, you've got to flee from those types of, of, of environments. As it says, evil company corrupts good habits or good morals. We talked about that in our study, the first Corinthians. How is it that the Corinthian Christians came to be so worldly? Very simply, by compromising with the world, by being influenced by the world, by being unequally yoked with the world. And finally, Paul asks, what agreement has the temple of God with idols or false gods? What agreement is the temple of God? How can the temple of God say yes and amen with false gods? A temple is to be a holy place, right? There's a reason there's not a temple standing in Jerusalem anymore. It's because you are the temple. I am the temple. We are the temple of God, the church. And Paul reminds us of that. For you are the temple of the living God. 
as God has said. So it wasn't just that Paul said it. God has said it many times, many times throughout the Old Testament. God says here, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their God and they shall be my people. Therefore, verse 17, here's the application. Here's what wraps up the whole chapter in a, in a neat little bow. Come out from among them. Come out of the world. Come out from among the world. Unyoke yourselves from the world. And this is very simply, it, it, it is a call to holiness. And then he goes on, and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean. Paul quoting Isaiah chapter 52. And so, here's the benefit of one who separates himself from the world. Here's the glorious promise being fulfilled of one who answers this call to holiness. Again, understanding that separating yourself from sin, separating yourself from the world, it's going to cost you something. It's going to cost you relationships. It's going to cause you to be subjected to criticism and persecution. Forsaking the world is going to cause you to be rejected by the world. Understand that. But Paul says to such a person, look at this, striving for holiness is going to cost you something, but you do this. You commit to holiness and God says, I will receive you. Not only that, I will be a father to you and you shall be my sons and daughters. Says who? Says the Lord Almighty. And this word almighty is, is, is the ancient Greek word pantocrator and it means the Lord who has his hand on everything. So what do you get for forsaking sin, forsaking the world, unyoking yourself from anything or anyone ungodly? What do you get for answering this call to be separated, consecrated unto God, separate from the world? What do you get for answering this call to holiness? I'll tell you what you get. The one thing you should desire more than anything, and that's greater intimacy with God. Awesome, majestic intimacy with the God of the universe who created you for that very thing. And to the same degree that you walk in holiness, you experience God as your loving Father. Why doesn't God love me? Why doesn't I reach out to God and God, He just won't answer and I just want my Father well? Are you walking in holiness? Or do you have compromise in your life? Now this is not about salvation. God becomes our Father when we trust in Jesus Christ as our Savior. But listen to me this morning. God cannot be a father to us. He cannot treat us as his precious sons and daughters until we separate ourselves from sin and separate ourselves from the world. Till we kick Satan and the world out of our heart and we give Jesus 100% capacity. I like how Warren Wearsby puts this in his study. He says, Salvation means that we enter into the Father's life. But it's separation that means we enter fully into the Father's love. John 14, 23, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. So God desires that you would come into the fullness of his life. He desires that you would come into the fullness of his love, that fatherly love. And to me, that's the greatest blessing that a human heart can experience this side of heaven. Deep, intimate fellowship with the God of the universe, all facilitated by making Jesus Lord of your life And then living that life in such a way that the world has no influence on it whatsoever. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you. We offer you our praise, our thanksgiving. We offer you ourselves. We declare your goodness and your majesty. We receive your grace. 
receive it in such a way, God, that it would never be received in vain, that we would walk in your statutes, that we would make no room for the flesh, that we would have no room in our hearts for sin, no room in our hearts for the world, no room in our hearts for Belial, but that you would resign and reside in us fully, wholly, and completely. That you would be that loving, gracious, awesome, beautiful Father that you desire to be to each of us. We love you. Again, we praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you need prayer, I'd love to pray with you after service. If you've never accepted the Lord, I'm here to pray with you. Pastor Sean, Pastor Ben, Pastor Jason are all here. Don't forget about our prayer service tonight here at uh, 6 p.m. Uh, here at the church. So come out for that. Remember, there's no midweek service this week uh, in observance of Thanksgiving. But we do have our Thanksgiving uh, meal here planned for the church at 1 p.m. Uh, so we'd like to, I think we had like, Seven, 75 people last year or something. We want to break that record this year. So invite, 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 and um, come and enjoy uh, fellowship with your family, your CCS family here. Next Sunday, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 7. So go ahead and read forward on that. Let's all stand and we'll close. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice to worship you, O my soul. Rejoice, take joy, my King, in what you hear. May it be a sweet, sweet sound in your ear. God bless you. Have a great week. Thank you for listening to Change the World with Pastor Vic Carroll from Calvary Somerville. It is our hope that this message will help you grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ.